Welcome back from the break, and welcome to our second panel as we uh, continue to build momentum. And I also want to um, share how impressed I am that we've been able to keep more or less on time so far. It's like a counteroffensive. Miraculous, I think, might be the word that I would use. So we'll see. We'll see how we go. But so far, so good. Um, so this second session addresses where we are now. Right. This panel brings together experts currently active in research, policy, and industry to converse about the impacts of cannabis, psychedelics, and drug policy on medicine, scientific research, business, and culture. The moderator uh, will be Peter Grinspoon, who you all know very well by now, so I won't reintroduce him. But we'll also include Alan St. Pierre, Jay Wexler, and Janester Wilson King. Thank you very much. Uh, can you guys hear me? All right, I'm just going to give a very brief introduction as to how um, I know these three dignified colleagues and um, a little bit of background. Um, Janester is a friend and a colleague. We both went to Swarthmore, and we work together at this fantastic nonprofit called Doctors for Cannabis Regulation. Um, by training, she's an obstet obstetrician gynecologist, and she really is just a fantastic cannabis clinician, sort of pioneering a lot of the stuff in, in obstetrics and gynecology, but I, I believe you treat many more things than that. Yeah. So she's going to give us a perspective from a cannabis clinician, what it's like today as a cannabis clinician, which is very different than it was even a few years ago. Now, Alan is, um, how do you describe Alan? Alan's been a family <laughs> friend since like uh, before birth and a very close friend of my dad's. And Alan was head of normal for 25 years. So Alan like kept the movement going through dark days, through good days for two and a half decades. And I have to say, Alan, whenever I need to know anything about cannabis, I used to ask my dad. Now that I can't do that, I ask you. You're like a CD-ROM, and you're also like so generous about sharing your information. So Alan is an infinite wealth of information about all about the legalization movement. So if anybody has any questions. Um. <laughs> and then Jay, uh, I met when Jay is a professor of um, law at BU, law, and he was a um, law clerk for Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who's very poignant on today um, for reasons we won't get into. Um, and he has a book coming out on cannabis, which I can't wait to read, called Weed Rules. And <clears throat> when I first met Jay, he um, invited me to uh, participate. He invited me and another um, colleague from Doctors for Cannabis Regulation uh, named Rachel Knox. He invited us to participate in just a seminar about cannabis. But he put me right after Jonathan Hawkins, who is fair to say it's on the other side. I mean, just a brief quote from Jonathan Hawkins in an article he wrote fairly recently for National Affairs. It is clear we would all be better off if marijuana did not exist. Given the abundance of alternative sources of intoxication and fun, the harm suffered by abusers probably outweighs the pleasure derived by its controlled users. So I ended up in this position of like, do I debunk everything he says or do I give the speech that I was going to give? And you know, between Jonathan Hawkins, myself, and Rachel Knox, the other board member for Doctors for Cannabis Regulation, it sort of became the Jerry Springer show. But it was really fun. Which is always good for a conference. <laughs> and you know, could happen here. It was really fun. <laughs> yeah, no, I, it's, it's, I'm, I'm worried about that. That's why I'm sitting way over here. Um, but so, and we're going to talk about the present. Now, you know, the present isn't that completely disconnected from the past and the future, but um, Alan's going to get us started. Um, and here's to Alan. Oh, thank you, everybody, for attending, um, for caring about this issue, and for UMass and the staff for putting it on, and, and the archives um, that recognized some years ago the importance of this social movement, because the archive is full of social movements and the struggles that they go through and, and all the human frailties that it takes to get from point A to point B. Um, I'm going to just, even though it's easy to do this from a linear point of view because we can go from the years, but um, I just have a brief outline to rapidly 
distill all of this to a couple of uh, inflection points about how things could have gone one way or the other. Um, certainly, when I got involved in 1990-91, uh, I would count it now as the height of the war on drugs, sort of its peak. You have um, drug testing, mandatory minimum sentencing, civil forfeiture, arrest rates going from 200 to 300 to 500,000 annually for, for cannabis alone. Um, the Posey Comitatus Act is effectively gutted and we have military-like eradication of helicopters in many parts of the United States. Uh, you had forward-looking infrared, infra, forward infrared radar, police just going around and looking into people's homes electronically to determine whether they are using the type of lamps that could grow marijuana, but they could, of course, be used for other legal endeavors. And one of my great sophistries observed in the war on drugs, drug tax stamps. All of these things were coming together when I walked in the door. And so uh, if it wasn't for, in 1994-95, that Lester, as was described earlier by Keith, reorganized Normal's board of directors and invited Keith back. So my tenure at Normal would have been maybe at best four or five years if both Keith and Lester did not come back and reconstitute Normal and, and reaffirm it as the cannabis consumers lobby group, acknowledging at the same time that the most important philanthropic money and the strategic impetus had moved to other organizations, the Drug Policy Foundation, and then later Ethan's group, the Drug Policy Alliance. So um, also, too, at that point, medical marijuana was the only viable discussion within popular culture. Uh, DEA, Normal versus DEA, the seminal 24-year case, laid down the foundation that, quoting the judge in the case, that marijuana was the safest therapeutic substance known to humans. So from my point of view, as somebody who did not use medical marijuana, I just enjoyed using cannabis recreationally as an adult, that we would never get to the point of decriminalization or legalization if a doctor could not prescribe or recommend cannabis for a sick, dying, or sense-threatened patient. So sort of even though I was 24, 25 years old, I had to sort of defer intellectually uh, entirely to medical marijuana as the most viable discussion on how to move us from total prohibition of marijuana to the legalization of it in cannabis commerce. And of course, Lester played a huge role in that. He was at that point just about to publish um, Marijuana, the, um, Marijuana the Forbidden Medicine. And uh, also at that time, importantly, that the California legislature, a country unto itself, passed not one, but two medical marijuana bills that generally reformers advocated for and endorsed. But the then Republican governor, Wilson, vetoed both of them. And that was a serious mistake by the government. Because had the government just yielded this much quarter, and at the same time, the current, the, the George Bush senior administration, they too were willing behind the scenes to allow, potentially, for medical marijuana for very limited cases. So had the government just simply acknowledged there was medical use, I would suggest to you a few hundreds of thousands of people in the early 1990s would be using medical marijuana. And decriminalization and legalization probably would have been put on ice for potentially decades. But because the government yielded no quarter, and their opposition was so obscene and so absurd and so anti-scientific, they created this massive social impetus to reform the laws. And they ranged from ragtag gay activists in California to the height of the Ivy Towers in Cambridge. And so it's the court cases, the ballot measures, and presidential elections that really determine where this goes in the future. The other that people would not think about, and we all live through, unless you're quite young, under 20, was 9-11. And as terrible as that was, 
it actually took, in, on, from my point of view, the government's foot off the gas. It clearly could not prioritize necessarily going after marijuana consumers when we had this war on terror. And so you see the government start to pull back the D.A.R.E. program, uh, Partnership for Drug Free America ads. All of that abates. And during that period of time, there is remarkable reform. And it's largely led by Ethan Nadelman. And as much as Keith started the marijuana law reform movement as a professional social justice movement, it is Ethan who takes that mantle, as he described, and really invigorates it with the necessary funding, strategy, and chutzpah that moves this to the point where we're at today. So we're blessed that in this room today we have the individuals who literally moved us from point A to point B. And it's during this period of time that Ethan, working with, in conjunction with the Marijuana Policy Project, there was sort of break up the work to make the load easier, ended up notably in 1996 passing Prop 215, which breaks open all of the reforms that happen in the next six years. All of the West Coast states largely vote in the majority for medical marijuana. Almost all the New England states join them. And so during that period of time, you have remarkable amounts of sway in public opinion, public polling, culture. You have dozens of TV shows, Murphy Brown, um, uh, uh, Dozens and dozens of TV shows on <laughs> Main Street. Some stereotypes are true. <laughs> There's just you know, t movies that talk about medical marijuana in a way that really just stuck it to the government in terms of how absurd its position was. And then in 19, and for, so we have this incredible breakthrough period from 2010 through 2016 where the state of Colorado and New Mexico around the same period of time, but most notably Colorado, legalizes medical marijuana, sets up a taxation scheme and regulations. A total break from the federal government. And from that, we get federal memos. First, the Ogden one in 2009 or 10, and most importantly, the Cole memos in 2013, that largely lay out the idea that the federal government is not going to intervene in states that move in this direction. And it's important to note again that this is done legislatively. All the reforms up to that point had been driven by reform groups and their energy. But to have the legislation move this was that whole next era. Uh, and of course the major breakthrough, well, I should say that in 2010, California tried to legalize marijuana and it failed by just a couple percentage points. But the initiative was backed by a wheelchair-bound medical marijuana advocate who, for all intents and purposes, in the minds of the federal government, was a drug dealer. And even though all of us worked with the folks in California, Normal MPP, Drug Policy Foundation, et cetera, it was not spawned by these groups, and so they did not invest in it as necessarily as they should have. And it probably would have passed had we all done so. But recognizing that it came so close and that the post-mortem done on it uh, indicated that there was messaging that could go from 48 to 49 percent to 52 to 53 percent to get into the majority to finally win one of these. And of course that happened in 2012 in Colorado and in Washington State. And again, the work was broken up between MPP doing Colorado and DPA and the ACLU doing Washington State. And they passed. And by doing so, again, affirmed this massive change in American history that also affected, as in Ethan indicated, international laws as well. Um, Again, the feds sort of say uncle by producing these memos. And what do we have today? We have 20 states that have legalized marijuana for sale to adults. 
We have over 40 states that have medical marijuana laws that largely look like selling marijuana to individuals who have the recommendations. There are over 300,000 people who are employed in the marijuana industry, about four times more than the coal industry. And you think about the political sway that the coal industry has, and it is probably just a matter of time that the cannabis industry, and likely behind that, the psychedelic industry, will uh, also and should enjoy political and social sway because of the aman immense amount of commerce um, here in Massachusetts, along with three or four other states like Illinois, within just a two to four year period post legalization, the sale and tax revenue from marijuana products surpass alcohol. Meaning that this was always pent up, always there for government to tap into. These billions and billions of dollars that now find their way into tax coffers. Um, but of course, um, the challenges still exist, as indicated at the last panel. Anybody who read the New York Times in the last couple of days, <laughs> or read the Wall Street Journal editorial earlier in the week, know that some of the major media institutions not only still don't get marijuana and the need to fully end marijuana prohibition, but it smells of reefer madness in a way that I have not seen in about 10 or 15 years. Um, I, I think it's kind of a standalone. I don't think that mass media as a whole today is going to re-embrace reefer madness. But this, this past week, for me, reinforced the need to always be vigilant regarding the fact that these opinion makers, um, in this case, really seriously have warped, disturbed views about marijuana and those who use them, still to this day. Um, so. I've taken up a lot of time in trying to distill this, this 30 years here, but to indicate that um, we're on this precipice of change, as the next panel will indicate, that could not have been predicted just five years ago. And so um, I'm blessed with our other panelists here who are professionals in their space to describe to you, because of the work of Lester and all these pioneers, what they get to do now in their professions. I mean, if I could be reborn today and be a doctor so that I could take lessons in cannabinoids or be a law professor and know that there is a deep intellectual vein to mine regarding cannabis and cannabis commerce and in cognitive liberties. So um, I'll turn it over to my two panelists and enjoy what you have to say about where we're at today in this amazingly changed world. Can I just make one point as a moderator? Um, thank you, Ellen. Ellen acts as if this stuff just happened, but you were like, like had a huge role in making it happen. So I just want to say we all really appreciate that. Okay. Good morning. Can you hear me? Okay. Very good. Because I sometimes speak softly. Not all the reasons, though. Um, I am very honored to be a participant at this event. I thank the Grinspoon family, uh, the staff at the Archives of UMass, and wonderful Caroline. I, she drove to Bradley Airport last <laughs> night to pick me up after my flight was delayed for about three hours. So the staff is on top of everything. Um, and I'm really appreciative of the invitation. <laughs> Dr. Grinspoon's books, Marijuana Reconsidered and Marijuana, the Forbidden Medicine, were very influential in my clinical journey. In fact, they were the first books I read about cannabis. And they opened my eyes and started me on a path on which I'm still journeying. I often quote stories from his books to my patients to illustrate the value of this medicine. And Dr. Grinspoon is the reason that I am a cannabis clinician, or as Dr. Grinspoon termed it, a cannabinopathic medicine clinician. Now, Dr. Grinspoon and I have something in common. We are both parents who lost a child, an unspeakable and unimaginable tragedy. But we did 
We are carrying on. We did, and we are carrying on. Peter and I, as you, sorry about that, as you heard him say, are, have something in common. We're both graduates of Swarthmore College. I will not tell you the years of our graduation. <laughs> um, but we're also on the board of directors at Doctors for Cannabis Regulation. And we've become not just colleagues, but really good friends. All three of us love the cannabis plant and its benefits as a medicine. So finally, I want to say that many, many people, cannabis clinicians and physicians, advocates, veterans, and warriors for justice had, can all say that Dr. Grinspoon had an impact on us professionally and personally. And we are all indebted to his legacy of work and the sacrifices he made. I'm glad he was able to see Massachusetts legalize cannabis and was able to smoke the first legal joint. Yes. <laughs> now my task here is to talk about how cannabis has impacted uh, clinicians, has impacted healthcare now. And I can quote statistics about uh, cannabis programs and their effects on, on what physicians do, such as 20 to 30 percent decrease in prescriptions for various dr drugs like anti-anxiety, anti-depressants, and um, pain meds, sleep meds. But I want to let the patients speak. I'm going to tell you about a few of my patients. I have a 40-year-old who had more than 15 years of insomnia, failed all medical treatment and modalities, who now sleeps at least six hours a night using cannabis. A 42-year-old female who was on more than 300 milligrams of Oxy per day is now weaned off the oxy and using cannabis and has an improved quality of life. A hospice patient was able to be comfortable and awake more often than not, who dies hours after talking with family most of the day. And if any of you are aware of what happens in hospice, Often they're medicated with morphine and all kinds of drugs that make them just zonked out and drowsy all day. So to be able to speak, talk to family and spend quality time is absolutely a miracle. A 40-year-old woman with a long history of endometriosis and all the physical, emotional, and mental suffering that goes with it now has good pain management and is able to enjoy a happy marriage and a healthy sex life. That's huge in women with endometriosis. A 43-year-old 43 woman with a long history of debilitating anxiety, such that she could not hold down a job, found tremendous relief with a high CBD tincture, and now has control over her anxiety and is a functioning contributing citizen. These, are my, these next two are my favorites. I have a 72-year-old woman who had a long history of depression who now has a social calendar. She is telling me all the little dates that she has and the bridge games and all sorts of things she's doing. And lastly, and people think that the elderly stop living after a certain age. But that's not true. I have an 82-year-old woman who still played softball in a senior travel league. But she suffered from pain throughout her body each night and couldn't sleep. So now she has minimal pain and can sleep through the night. And she tells me she has upped her game. I actually went out and saw one of these games, and my goodness, they are serious about softball, much more serious than I would be. But it's, it's, it's really 
it's, it's wonderful to see that life does not stop just because you turn 80 or 85. So physicians utilizing cannabis in their practices are seeing transform, transformation of lives on a regular basis. Now, I'm, not, I'm going to be honest here. Cannabis, cannabis is not the solution to everything, and cannabis should, use should be a part of an overall treatment program. It's not just the cannabis. Uh, some patients don't respond to cannabis. And some patients uh, do OK, but they're not impressed. So it it's, has to be used purposefully and in conjunction with other things. So cannabis has allowed clinicians to help patients with conditions that respond poorly to traditional medications and modalities. Uh, endometriosis, autism, epilepsy. Cannabis also helps patients avoid polypharmacy. There, I talked to uh, one of the participants here today, and uh, a patient was on two different anticoagulants. He has so many physicians, and no one's following what else everybody is on. So it's, it's really important. Cannabis can also help patients to decrease or discontinue their use of alcohol or other substances of abuse. Because you know cannabis is safer than many other substances, has a very low, uh, it's less likely to cause dependence, and has a better safety profile. So cannabis can be very helpful in helping people to uh, stop using alcohol and other things. We talked about, well, I mentioned seizures. And there are patients with seizure disorders who don't respond to pharmaceuticals as well as they should. They still have seizures. Cannabis can give them better control of their lives. And I'm not saying it always stops the seizures. It can, but not always. But it helps them have better control and actually be able to have a, a quality of life. Now, one of the most important aspects, or one of the patients I illustrated, the hospice patient, cannabis use in the end of life care is really, has really been impactful. And cannabis, finally, I'll say that cannabis not only helps or is a medicine for physical health conditions, but I've seen cannabis impact the mental, emotional, and spiritual areas in a patient, spiritual health of patients. I've seen patients actually grow and become more open and receptive to life and its possibilities. That is absolutely wonderful. Now, there are some challenges still, and I don't want to be remiss in, in not mentioning them. Cannabis is expensive, and insurances do not cover the physician's visit or consultations, and they don't cover, insurances don't cover the medicine, the expenses of the medicine. Now, I will say this, the state of New York has mandated that cannabis, that the insurances cover the physician consultations. And there are some workmen's comp programs that will pay for cannabis medication, but those are rare exceptions. So then you, you also have the, the patients, patients being excluded because of economics, social economic statuses. Hospitals, another challenge is hospitals need to have policies and procedures that address cannabis use. Now, I do understand that this is a complex issue, but we need to do something. Now, there's a couple of other areas here. The idea of qualifying conditions that many states have when it comes to cannabis use and cannabis recommendations. No politician, no politician, did I say no politician <laughs> needs to be involved in physician-patient decisions on treatment? <laughs> well, now, the, 
the idea of applying THC caps is also ludicrous. All, patient, all it does is it's going to cause patients to have to spend more money because they have to buy the amount needed to remedy the condition. It's just, it's, it's just ridiculous. Also, physicians. Physicians need to be more educated. There are plenty of educational programs. The premier educational program is at the Society of Cannabis Clinicians. We have a 23-module course that will teach you everything you need to know about cannabis. So even if you don't, if physicians don't recommend cannabis, they can still, they should seek enough knowledge to answer some of the basic questions because patients are searching far and wide and they want answers. And when they come to go to their physician, they should be able to get answers to some very basic questions. Also, more research is needed. Uh, as long as cannabis is Schedule One, research will remain limited and narrow. It should be descheduled, but I'll accept rescheduled for now. And finally, the social justice and health equity issues surrounding the industry. This industry will not be where it, anywhere near where it should be if we ignore the tragedy and total disruption of black and brown lives that it has, that the ridiculous, racist, and failed war on drugs has caused. That also includes pregnant women who are near and dear to my heart. They should not be criminalized. So we need to stop the harm and start the healing. But to end on a hopeful note, we are witnessing the emergence of a brand new specialty, cannabis clinicians. You can call it whatever you want. But we're seeing surgeons, cardiologists, emergency room physicians, and all sorts of uh, OBGYNs and all sorts of specialists add cannabis to their practices or even establish dedicated cannabis practices. Physicians tend to find more enjoyment in those types of practices and better connections with their patients, as well as patients get to experience more hope and more benefits. Nothing in life should be feared, just understood. Now is the moment to understand more and fear less. That's my take on cannabis impacting healthcare today. Um, thank, Janessa, thank you so much for the work that you do. Um, the world truly needs more people like you. Um, if I could just echo two or three things you said. Um, my dad, at, with his end of life, um, we used cannabis instead of opiates. And, um, you know, he was so much more with it than he would have been. And we only needed about three doses of morphine to get him from this world to wherever he is now. And you know, the night before, he was able to participate in a birthday party with his family, with his grandkids. If he were drugged out on opiates, that never would have happened. And we've had 108,000 opiate overdoses. Yep. The only way we're going to address that, aside from legalizing all drugs, including opiates, is with cannabis. I mean, it's going to be a huge part of it. And again, just thank you so much for the work that you do. And uh, if we could clone you, um, so there'd be a hundred of you, that would make the world a better place. And at this point, we should turn it over to Jay. Just one thing, if you notice I'm shaking, I am freezing cold up here. <laughs> <laughs> so forgive you, me. That's what Florida does to you. That's what Florida yeah. does. It's cold, that's true. Uh, well, thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank uh, the Grinspoon family and the University of Massachusetts for putting this amazing uh, day together and for inviting me to participate in it. Compared to some of the, the icons uh, in this room, I'm like a, I feel like a little baby bird kind of <laughs> chirping uh, with cannabis. Um, uh, I, I'm new to, to the field about six or seven years. I'll tell you a little bit about how I got uh, into teaching cannabis law in a bit. 
Um, I did not, I have not, did not have the honor or pleasure of meeting Lester Grinspoon, although um, I, it's not true that Peter and I just met a few years ago because in fact, Peter was my doctor in 2001 <laughs> Uh, and actually, I have the, the, your <laughs> diagnosis of my high cholesterol here. I just have some questions about this. From I wasn't allowed to say that. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hippa. Hippa. Peter is an amazing, awesome doctor. I can tell you that. Uh, is an amazing, uh, awesome doctor. Um, so I've been asked to, to talk a little bit about the, the, the um, uh, cannabis and where we are now from a legal perspective. And so I thought I would just make some comments on four different in, uh, cannabis in four different contexts. Uh, in the states, state legislatures and agencies, in Congress, um, in the courts, and then finally in the law schools and the legal profession. So in the states, we've, uh, uh, as Alan uh, said, we have about 20 states that have legalized and m most of those states have created regulations to, 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 to guide the markets, to guide markets within the state. And it's, uh, it's worth pointing out, I think, how amazingly difficult that job is as a, uh, for these regulators to come up with these regulations, because there's so much they have to do. There's, there's so many uh, 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 forces in pushing it up in different ways. Do you uh, improve, uh, pr promote equity? Do you, uh, do you raise revenue? When you raise revenue, you increase costs, and the costs have impact on equity. You want to protect the environment, but that is going to uh, 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 maybe impede access to certain uh, products at low prices. It's just an incredibly, incredibly difficult job. Uh, and the states have, uh, have gone about it, I, I think, in a fairly amazing way um, from the regulatory perspective. Now, the results, I think, are, are, are everybody would agree, I think, are mixed. Um, I'll just, make, and one can make comments on a million different things. I'll just make uh, comments on two different things. Uh, one of them is to echo the social equity point, which is uh, that our programs uh, are not doing what, uh, what we had hoped that they would do with respect to social equity in all of its forms, not just participation of people of color in the industry itself, but also um, uh, criminal justice reforms, expungement, um, uh, issues about uh, about uh, providing uh, funding to communities that were harmed by the drug war. I was reading the the Minority Cannabis Business Association earlier uh, this year had a report, and, and and it was highly critical of of state social equity gr uh, ground uh, efforts on all counts. So there's a lot more that needs to be done there. The second point I'm going to make, which is kind of a pet peeve of mine, is that it's great that we have these regulations that are allowing markets to. To, to, to open up in all the, all the states. But for my, from, uh, I still think these regulations treat cannabis as a second, third class, maybe lower uh, substance, recreational option. And I think there's just way too much grudging tolerance going on uh, in our regulations. Uh, there's, uh, cannabis companies are not allowed to advertise or market like other companies. That, uh, people are still getting fired uh, in many states for, for using cannabis off the job. Uh, there are no, uh, the social use establishments that, that was, were mentioned in the, in the prior panel have not really gotten off the ground. There's too much local control and ability of local cities and, state, uh, cities and towns to prohibit cannabis uh, uh, sales within their uh, jurisdiction. So I think that we need, we need to sort of replace grudging tolerance with what I like to think of as careful exuberance, uh, which is, uh, you know, careful because, of course, there are public health harms to cannabis, but exuberance because it's pretty great. And uh, we ought to, I wish the states would recognize a little bit of that instead of grudgingly being pulled into this to, to legalization. So there's, those are two thoughts I have about uh, about the state efforts at the state level. At, at the congressional level, uh, little seems to be happening. Of course, the House has passed the Moore Act a couple of times. The House has packed, passed the Safe Banking Act many times, mm -hmm. but the Senate is not doing anything. And I don't think anybody really thinks that, uh, that, that there's going to be legalization in this Congress. Uh, uh, people could disagree, and we can talk about that. But, uh, uh, and I don't think the next Congress uh, is going to be looking any better. So, That's <laughs> right? So um, now, there's maybe chances of, of getting pieces of legislation that address some of the disabilities imposed by federal legalization. 
here and there, like the Safe Banking Act, or maybe something on intellectual property or, or veterans or things like that, little pieces. Uh, and in fact, I, I hadn't thought about it this way until recently when I've started hearing a lot of people talk about it this way, but it could very well be that federal legalization is not gonna be a, uh, just a moment where all, there's a, a statute and, and all of a sudden cannabis is descheduled, but rather it might be something that happens incrementally over time, and may, maybe never even descheduled, but simply I can imagine Congress whittling away at certain of the disabilities that uh, legal disabilities that, that, that federal illegality impose on the industry, which are, are, are of course, enormous. Um, with respect to the courts, uh, thank goodness the Supreme Court has stayed out of this. Uh, this is a terrible day to be a constitutional law professor. Uh, um, uh, and, uh, you know, so the court was involved in, in cannabis last in 2005 in the Reich case. Um, here and there, you see little pieces of the court getting kind of interested in, this, in, 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 in cannabis law. Uh, most recently, there's uh, Justice Thomas. Uh, Justice Thomas Deep breath. Deep breath. <laughs> issued a, a, a separate opinion um, in a case with the, which the court denied involving the tax law, Section 280E, for those of you uh, who know about that uh, awful thing. Um, and Justice Thomas pointed out in a separate, in, a, in sort of a statement concerning the denial of certiorari, that the federal government's approach to marijuana uh, regulation these days has, is, is, is so, uh, it's half in, half out, is what he said. And it seems incoherent to him uh, what's going on at the federal level. So that's somewhat interesting. Um, I don't know if what will happen because of that, maybe nothing. Um, most recently, it looked like the court might be interested in taking a case involving the workers' compensation issue, a case called Musta, I believe, or something like that, versus Mendota Heights Dental uh, Center from Minnesota. The issue that's come up in many states, and the states are split on this, is whether the federal, whether the Controlled Substances Act preempts uh, states that, tr that require employers to, to, to reimburse patients for, for medical cannabis. And two states have said yes, two states have said no. The Supreme Court actually asked for the views of the Solicitor General in this uh, case, which is fairly mm -hmm. rare. Mm -hmm. So it seemed like they were interested in maybe taking the case, but they denied cert, uh, denied, refused review a couple of days ago. But if that, if that issue continues to percolate, uh, it's possible that we'll see the Supreme Court jump in. Uh, though I hope they stay away. <laughs> uh, and there are many, lots and lots of fascinating cases at the lower courts level, everything from uh, interpreting employment protection statutes to m one of my favorite issues, which is about the Fourth Amendment and what happens to probable cause with, with, among the police. If you, now you, if you bring a dog that alerts to marijuana in a state where cannabis is legal, uh, is that a search? Uh, Colorado Supreme Court said it was a search, uh, which was, I thought, an amazing decision, but other, other courts may not be so friendly to it, to that claim. Finally, um, let me just say a little bit about the legal profession and law schools. Um, so I, I've only, as I mentioned, been um, new, fairly new, certainly compared to many of the people in this room. About six years ago, I was sitting in my office and, uh, and, a, and the, the, the textbook uh, marketer or textbook salesperson came into my office and said, um, you know, do you, we have this new case book, which is how we teach you know, classes in law school, uh, on, on marijuana law. Do you know anybody at Boston University who might be interested in teaching it? And I think she had an inkling that it, could, that it would be me. Uh, and I was like, yes! Uh, uh, and I asked my dean, and the dean was like, oh, okay, Wexler. Uh, and uh, and let, but let me do it, and it has been just such an amazing experience teaching this seminar uh, uh, for the last six years. The students are, are just, you know, of course it meets in 420, which makes it easy for everybody to know where the class is. The registrar finally, I don't even have to ask the registrar anymore for the room. Uh, but but uh, the students are, uh, it's always oversubscribed, the students love it. It's fascinating not just because of, uh, of all the, uh, that, because the law is changing so quickly uh, and it's so interesting and important, but also because it touches on almost every, cannabis law touches on almost every area of law you can think of, from constitutional law to criminal law, environmental law, immigration law, and so on and so forth. So students come in from all different backgrounds. Some of them just want a fun 3L third year law school course, but a lot of them 
uh, are interested in criminal defense or, or some other area of law, and they're taking it for that reason. And it's amazing how even in the six years uh, that I've been teaching it, the, the attitude towards cannabis seems to have changed among the students. When I first taught it, people were not talking about how they use cannabis. Like everyone was a little worried, you know, I'm taking the bar soon, I don't know what the thing is about that. And I didn't push them, but now people are openly talk, talk about their use and benefits it brings them and the benefits it brings their, their family and their friends. And I think that that's changed really quickly. And so is the legal profession, I think. Uh, others in the room could speak to this more than I can, but I remember even six years ago, I would have guest speakers come in from firms and they would, uh, uh, and, 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 and the idea was there were, there were a couple of firms that did cannabis law and then there were every other firm that was very wary, but these days, the big firms are involved. The big, uh, big firms more and more ha have cannabis practices. I have students who go out to do whatever they're doing and then they call me two years later and say, I'm on this cannabis issue or this cannabis case and it's fascinating and I wish I had taken your class. And, and I say, yeah, that, that's all right. Uh, and, and, uh, and it just seems like it's so much more mainstream now uh, that in, in only six years that it's a big difference. The one thing, uh, the last thing I'll say is that I do think law schools have uh, uh, something we can provide, uh, uniquely provide here, which is uh, in the, in the in clinical area, clinical teaching of law schools, and experiential learning in law schools, which is, all, uh, which is becoming more and more important every day in law schools. I think that we at law schools should be able to develop programs to help our students uh, help cannabis businesses, particularly equity applicants, uh, people of color who are trying to get into the industry and have to navigate these hundred pages of regulations uh, and can't afford uh, to hire a, a big law firm to help them. This is, I think, where law uh, schools and law students might be able to, to, to really add some value. And we've made little, little baby steps towards this at BU in t trying to work on getting a, some, a, maybe a clinic started or, or some other experiential program to help uh, in that area, and it, it hasn't gone far, but I, we're still hoping to do it and thinking about it in other schools. Uh, I hope we'll also do it because I think that would be a great partnership between uh, the, the law schools, the legal profession, the, the industry, and, and everything that uh, we believe in with respect to social equity in the cannabis space. So thank you very much. Wow, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Jay, for your work. We, we need more of you, too. You need to be cloned. Um, really, this is spectacular. I can't wait to read your book, Weed Rules. What's the full name of it, Weed Rules? Weed Rules, Blazing the Way to a Just and Joyous Marijuana Policy. That's going to be awesome. Right. And uh, you raised nice so title. many interesting issues that we could talk about, just like they said in the first panel, for about five hours. Um, I do want to leave time for questions, but I want to ask our panelists any, any comments or thoughts before we go to the... Masses? Well, I guess uh, just I alluded to how things could go one way or the other just in a moment of time. And the two, uh, one's a legal case and one's a vote. And both are, are kind of cryptic. Um, one is Conant versus McCaffrey. That's a 1996 or 97 case or so. And Conant was a famed AIDS doctor at the University right, of San right. Francisco. And uh, of course, the entire fulcrum that medical marijuana is based on is the ability for the doctor to talk right. to the patient. Right. And so what the government did was come in and say, you can't have that conversation. It was an amazing federal trial that Ethan and company held back. And again, it's many examples where the DPA and Ethan don't come in there with the resources and the right expertise, then this movement goes completely the other way. So the judge was flabbergasted in the case. You could see he almost wanted to give a bench ruling because the idea that the government was coming into a federal court and saying, and by the way, do you know who that person was? Who was the uh, lawyer? The future Attorney General of the United States, Eric Holder. He was the attorney largely in charge of that. And so, uh, and again, it speaks to how things change quite radically because I will allude to in a moment about how that presidential election, of course, of 2008 is totally consequential. If we have Mr. McCain as president, we're not sitting in this room today talking about hardly any of the reforms that have happened. Um, the other is a case, again, 
where uh, Ethan and company recognized the importance to jump in late, um, Oregon was the first state to decriminalize marijuana. Well, in the late 90s, when there were some Republican takeovers of otherwise Democratic-led governments, this was the case in Oregon, in their brief period of time of having power, the Republicans sought to recriminalize marijuana. That effort had never been done before. But thankfully, the voters of Oregon rejected it by about 65%. Had they passed it, I suggest it would have started a whole new tranche of cases and efforts to recriminalize marijuana in the states 13 or 14 that had just marginally decriminalized it. So um, again, um, a court case, an election uh, goes the different way. We're not sitting in this room today. Uh, comments or should I open to questions? Uh, we probably... Go ahead and open. Any questions? <laughs> David. The big elephant in the room that I think needs to be raised, uh, which is that, as many of you know, uh, the Supreme Court this morning uh, yeah. announced that they are uh, overturning Roe v. Wade. And when somebody, of course, when we learn about that, everyone in here would know about it. It's awful and upsetting. And somebody said to me, oh, it's horrible that this happened on the day we're doing this, which it is. Well, having not read, I would defer to Jay uh, for expertise, to, but just in my own, from a layman's point of view, uh, the, the, the leaked draft clearly indicates that the justices, the writer of that particular case, um, sees this as an extension to other things, that, that this is just one other matter that, say, medical marijuana or marijuana will also fall under. So um, I haven't read this decision that came out today. It's just a few hours old. but. It is totally consequential, to say the least, David. Yeah, it's, it's in, I'll just say one thing before the expert. <laughs> it's, it's indicative of the attack on women, people of color, and anybody else who is not a white homosexual male, heterosexual male, excuse me. <laughs> It, it, it is an attack, and it's part of the plan to make us all second-class people. And we have to do something. Something has to be done. Take it away. I, I don't really, yeah, I mean, that. all of that is absolutely right, of course. Uh, and I haven't read the opinion, I, I, of course, also. Um, but I, And this, that's what I meant when I said it was a terrible day to be a constitutional law professor. I, I you know, look very quickly at some commentary and it does, it looks like the final draft is, seems very similar to the, the leaked draft. And it seems also that Justice Thomas has a separate opinion uh, oh. arguing that uh, the, the doctrine, so, so one of the issues that comes, come, will come out of it, and we have to read the, the decision to see how it's worded and exactly what it says, but it sounds like Justice Thomas in, in his separate opinion said this. Uh, that, that not only this particular issue, uh, uh, but also that the doctrine, the legal doctrine upon which it's based, which is called substantive due process, which is also the basis for, for protection of, uh, of contraception and is the, is the basis for the Obergefell uh, gay marriage case. Uh, Thomas says this is, it, it's all in question. So that just makes it worse, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, it's it's yeah, it's really awful. It makes you to want. Me. It makes you need a puffer too. Well, that <laughs> after party. <laughs> um, Jake, you had a question. Wait till tonight. <laughs> I have a few issues with 
vaping. We think vaping is safer than smoking, but we don't really know much about the vape pens. What is it doing to the oil in the vape pen? What temperature is it actually increase, uh, what temperature is it actually rising to? We may be, we may, it may not be safer than smoking. Well, it is in terms of the carcinogens, but are we creating new ones? So we, we really need to examine the vape pens and really get some studies on what they're actually doing to the oils. And we found out with the Valley, you cannot add other ingredients to the vape pen to maybe enhance or add to the effects of, of the cannabis oil. So uh, the word, I guess basically we say that vape pens are safer, but are they really? That's how I would say it. I have an overlapping answer. I was the expert witness in the case we sued the Baker administration because he banned, banned all vaping. And he banned both the vape pens, which I'm dubious about too because who knows what crap they have in them, and he banned dry herb vaporizers. And I honestly think a dry herb vaporizer is a much safer way to consume cannabis, obviously, than smoking or using the vape pens. Uh, you heat it up to 400 degrees instead of 1,100 degrees. When you incinerate it, when you smoke, again, you heat it up to 1,100 degrees. You get the tar, the benzene, the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Never been associated with lung cancer or COPD, but it does cause this chronic bronchitis. But if you use a dry herb vaporizer, you just have to heat it up to like 400 degrees to extract the cannabinoids. It tastes better, it's more economical, it's much easier in your lungs, and it just intuitively makes sense that if you're not getting all these bad chemicals, it's gonna be safer. Is it safe? We don't know yet. They just developed vaporizers. Um, again, I'm not a fan of the vape pen, but they just developed these dry herb vaporizers, what, 10, 15 years ago. Um, so time will tell, but I say to people, some people need to inhale it medically. They're really nauseous. What are they going to do? Take a pill? So if they're going to inhale it, I recommend a dry herb vaporizer, presuming it's safer than the other alternatives. Right. To add to that, too, the volcano, Dr. Grinspoon's favorite, <laughs> is probably the best way to inhale your cannabis. You get all of the parts of the plant without destroying them because you're using flour to, to vaporize. So that if you want to inhale, and that's true, many uh, people prefer, prefer to medicate by inhaling the volcano or some sort of vaporizer like that is the safest way to do it. We have time for one more question. Unless we've answered everything you've ever wanted to know. In the back. <laughs> Well, um, we are blessed that in the next panel, we have the godmother of diversity in the uh, marijuana and likely in the future in the psychedelic space, in Shalene Title, who was a former cannabis commissioner, to Jay's point about how difficult it is to marry all the concerns and come up with some relevant, reasonable policy. And so uh, you'll hear from her, I'm sure. Uh, because it's here in Massachusetts was the first place to envision it and put it into law, if you will. And because of her work and the fact that Massachusetts moved forward, it's now de rigueur in Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, and other states where we're just now seeing how this is going to play out. And to specifically to indigenous folks, I would certainly hope that would be extended as well. Um, there's no doubt in the last 15 or 20 years, if you're on the affluent and adventuresome side, these 
uh, psychedelic trips, um, the Ibogaine adventures, um, ayahuasca uh, in other parts of the world have certainly informed some very elite people in, around the world about the need for not only drug policy reform, but to acknowledge the shaman-like qualities that indigenous people bring to us regarding the use of these plant materials. We're over time, so if anybody has a question where if they don't ask it, they're going to blow up, we can take that question. But otherwise, <laughs> we're, we're out of time. <laughs> any, any desperate last questions? Done. All right. Rather violent. <laughs> Thank you.